At the end of the 19th century, the Danish king, Christian IX, and his queen, Louisa, succeeded in marrying their six children into the leading European royal families. And Christian IX thus became known as the father-in-law of Europe. Today, his family are found all over Europe. And quite exceptionally, these royal descendants have chosen to come together and talk about their family's incredible story, which they know from letters and diaries and from the stories that have been passed down to them through the generations. In addition, the family has also made private photos and films available, many of which have never been seen in public before. This episode is about Christian IX's second son, Wilhelm, seen here jumping up and down, and his descendants in Greece, Spain, Romania, and Yugoslavia. I plucked up my courage and asked if she wanted to come and stay with me in Greece. I said, for goodness sake, do not tell my parents because they will have a fit. Prince Wilhelm and his siblings know that their father will one day be king of Denmark. But nobody can know that Wilhelm will become king first. Wilhelm was Dagmar's and Alexander's favorite brother and particularly liked to ease up a tense or a serious situation by putting a, a sort of a radical joke or making a fun appearance. Behind the scenes at his sister Alexandra's wedding to the British heir to the throne in 1863, a lot of attention is paid to the 17-year-old Wilhelm. The British Foreign Secretary has had an idea. Wilhelm can be the new king of Greece. Greek revolutionaries have deposed the country's King Otto, and the great powers are having difficulty agreeing on a suitable replacement. The Greeks were very clear that they did not want to have a king that was coming from a big power uh, because of the influences the big powers would have and, uh, and they didn't want that. But then the British put forward the young Danish prince. The great powers agreed and I think probably uh, felt it uh, natural for him to become king because there were no strings attached. In Denmark, Wilhelm, who is a cadet at the Naval Academy, leaves home with a packed lunch as usual. One of the sandwiches was uh, sardines, which had a lot of oil. So the papers were doubled, and they were newspapers. And when he went to eat that sandwich, he saw that what was printed on the newspaper was that he had been appointed to be the first king of Greece. He said, nobody told me. On the 17th of September, 1863, the 17-year-old prince starts his long journey to Greece. And now he is no longer known as Wilhelm, but has had to change his name to George, King George I. And so down he went to Greece uh, with, uh, I think, one or two Danish aides with him, and, and, and then started life as king of Greece. I don't think he wanted to do that. So he left heartbroken Denmark, whom he adored, and everyone was convinced that he would not last. He ruled 50 years, and he's the longest ruler in the Greek history. The reception that awaits him in Athens is overwhelming. And as everyone wants to see the new king, it takes many hours to complete the carriage ride from the harbor up to the palace. He went through a considerable amount of agony because his bladder was bursting at that point. So he discovered a little hut on the side that uh, he ostensibly wanted to go and have a look at, but in reality he had a major crisis on him. Um, he then uh, arrived in Athens, and the interesting thing is that um, he never had dinner that night because all the cooks had also gone out to see the new king. So his first night in Athens, he went to bed hungry. The young king wakes up in an enormous palace, which has suffered much at the hands of ransacking revolutionaries. 
George selects a few rooms with a view of the garden, and here he arranges himself as spartanly as he was used to in Denmark. He was terribly lonely because he arrived there not knowing anything about this country, not knowing anything about who was who. But he was a hard worker. He learned Greek very soon. He wrote in Greek perfectly well. In connection with the appointment of George as king, his father has insisted that Queen Victoria hand over Corfu and the other Ionian islands to Greece. The British Crown agreed, and that's how those islands then came back with the king. When he turned up in Greece, they were handed over. This further increases the popularity of the already well-liked George. George understands that Greece's future is dependent on her relationship with the great powers, and this is a deciding factor in his choice of bride. He chose, of course, Russia, because Russia was the great protective power of Greece, and he said, I'm going to marry there. And he went to Russia and inspected all the marriageable grand duchesses, because there were many. And he found the youngest, who was 15 at that time, George marries the young Grand Duchess Olga, who is the Tsar's niece. And after the wedding in the Winter Palace, George returns home to Athens with his bride. The only thing she brought with her, other than her clothes, was her dolls and teddy bears. She arrives in Greece, she's 15, first court ball. They look everywhere for her, no Queen Olga. But she has to preside the ball, no? She wasn't found in her apartment, she wasn't found in the sitting rooms. My grandfather, George, got really very nervous. Where's the queen? Where's the queen? Where's the queen? And she was found under the staircase, playing with her dolls and crying. Because she wanted to be a little girl and not to be a queen. Olga's popularity with the Greeks reaches unknown heights when, age 16, she gives birth to a son. The succession is guaranteed. The little prince is named Constantine after Olga's father. And many more children will arrive. At 21 years of age, Olga is already the mother of four children. Within the home, George is responsible for deciding how the now six children should be brought up and he employs a German teacher to ensure that the children learn the virtues of discipline. He made very, very sure that every single one of his children grew up 100% Greek. This was very important to him, so that they would understand the, 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 the country and, and become part of it, and become part of it quickly. One day, one of the children, Nikolaos, somehow manages to stick a suction cup to his head so securely that nobody can remove it. He eventually pulled it off with a great sort of boop, and it left a huge ring on his forehead, which wouldn't have been very important, were it not for the fact that his uncle, William of Glücksburg, was dying. And uh, he went into the room to sort of pay his respects. And uh, his elder relations, who were very somber, as you can imagine, at the bedside, seeing this idiotic child come in with a red mark on his forehead, all burst into hysterical laughter. Olga gives birth to Prince Christopher, her seventh child, in 1888. My father was the last one of the family. Uh, he had 22 years difference with his eldest brother. Crown Prince Constantine, the oldest brother, is now ready to marry. My grandfather met uh, Sophie von Preussen in Germany, where he was training as a, an officer with the uh, German army. Constantine and Princess Sophie marry, but the marriage will be the cause of many problems in the future. Sophie is the sister of the aggressive German Kaiser Wilhelm II. He was very unkind to his sister, who married my grandfather, Constantine because uh, she became Greek Orthodox. The Kaiser immediately punishes his sister by banning her for three years from her country of birth. Constantine and Sophie have three sons, 
all of whom will at some point sit on the Greek throne, whilst a daughter will become queen of Romania and a granddaughter will be queen of Yugoslavia. George loves spending time with his large European family. He enjoys the annual summer reunions in Denmark, where he can spend time with, amongst others, his sister, Alexandra, who lives in England, and Dalma, who is visiting from Russia. Olga is also made to feel welcome by the family. Her sisters-in-law took her in as a sister, and Queen Olga and Queen Alexandra and Empress Maria Fedorovna uh, dressed in the same way. Obviously, that was also the fashion of the time, and also it was not bad for a queen of a new uh, dynasty in southern Europe to dress like the two, like the Empress of Russia and the Queen of England. The German Kaiser is not invited to the gatherings in Denmark, and he feels left out. One interesting thing about Kaiser Wilhelm II, who was my uh, great-grandfather from my mother's side, uh, was that uh, he always liked to go to Kofu in the Ionian Islands uh, in the late spring and do his holidays there. Now, the problem was that my uh, great-grandfather from my father's side, King George I of Greece, uh, did not like this idea at all. And every year, my grandfather George I would go and receive him at the hub. So one day, my grandmother Olga said, why do you go to receive him as you can't stand him? Ah, yes, but if I don't go to receive him, he will think he is in his kingdom and not in mine. So I have to be there so he knows he is in my kingdom. King George's second son, who is also named George, but is known by the family as Goggy, leaves Greece to seek happiness in France. He married a French lady, Marie Bonaparte. She was out of the Napoleonic family, and she was a student of Freud. So don't say we don't cover quite a lot of ground between us and this family. <laughs> Marie would like to become a doctor. And at that time, young ladies of good families were not allowed that. So she said, you don't want me to become a doctor, you will see worse. She left her family and went to Vienna to study with Freud and she became a renowned psychoanalyst uh, in the world of psychoanalysis. Princess Marie writes a number of books about psychoanalysis, including a detailed study of women's sexuality. Aunt Marie's mother was the daughter of the man who built and invented the casino of Monte Carlo, Monsieur Blanc. And upon receiving her inheritance, Marie becomes one of the richest women in Europe. The First Balkan War breaks out in 1912, when Greece, Montenegro, Serbia and Bulgaria declare war on Turkey in a combined attempt to force the Turks out of the Balkans. Crown Prince Constantine is made supreme commander of the Greek army. And after three weeks of fighting, the Greeks take Salonika. King George and Crown Prince Constantine are greeted by scenes of jubilation when they enter the northern Greek town. It is George's proudest moment. Every afternoon at about two o'clock after lunch, he would take an hour's walk. His son said to him, Papa, you can't do that because this town has just been liberated. There are a lot of foreign agents and there's a security problem. And he, no, nobody was going to stop him having his one-hour walk, so he took his walk. George looks forward to celebrating his golden jubilee in a few months' time. But this walk turns out to be his last. He was killed by uh, somebody in Salonika, uh, by a man, they thought it was an anarchist, but it was only a madman who just got up when he passed next to a cafe and shot him in the back. I met a Russian uh, princess and she told me that she was in the room in the palace in Athens when an aide walked in and said, Your Majesty, your husband the king has been assassinated. 
And I asked her, how did my grandmother react? And in her typical heavy Russian accent, oh my dear boy, she just got up and threw up. Greece has more than doubled in size during King George's 50-year reign, and the size of the population has increased dramatically too. Yet from this point, the role of King of Greece becomes a very insecure position. George is buried, and his son will now rule Greece as King Constantine I. As conquering commander, Constantine is adored by the Greek people. Then the First World War started, and there were intrigues, and they accused him of being pro-German because he had married the princess of Prussia. And then he became the most hated person in Greece. Both the Germans and the Allies are putting pressure on Constantine to enter the war on their respective sides. And by declaring Greek neutrality, he manages to disappoint and upset all sides in the war. In 1917, the Allies demand that Constantine abdicate and go into exile. He may choose his successor, but is told it can't be his eldest son, George, who is also seen as pro-German. There were three boys, and uh... I think it's one of the rare occasions in history where all three became king. The first choice is the second son, 24-year-old Prince Alexander, who has been driven to despair by the situation. The whole family had been kicked out, but Alexander. He was lonely, surrounded by enemies of his family. Alexander is nothing but a puppet king. And Greece now enters the war on the Allied side. After the First World War, Alexander marries the 21-year-old commoner, Aspasia Manos. I was very good she was not royal. It was about time you had some blood to mix in and uh, make things a bit more, shall we say, human. Aspasia becomes pregnant, but after less than a year of happy marriage, a tragic accident befalls Alexander. He went for a walk in the garden of the property where he lived, and his favorite dog was attacked by a monkey. And in separating uh, the fight, the monkey bit him, and blood poisoning ensued. There was nobody who had the, cu the courage to cut the king's leg off. There was no penicillin in those days. And he died of gangrene, really. Alexander is buried in Athens. His daughter, Alexandra, who was born after her father's death, will later marry the king of Yugoslavia. Through the process of a referendum, the Greeks decide that Alexander's father, Constantine I, should return to the throne. Constantine returns to a country that is at war with Turkey. And 18 months later, the Turks destroy his army, and over a quarter of a million Greeks lose their lives when Smyrna is obliterated. Because of the defeat and the burn and the disaster of Smyrna, again the public opinion turned against him, saying he's responsible for that. So they kicked him out for the second time. Constantine's brother, Prince Andrew, as well as five ministers are also held responsible and are imprisoned. The ministers are all executed, but with a death threat hanging over him, Andrew manages to flee the country, together with his wife and their little boy, Philippos. Many years later, the boy will become known as Prince Philip, consort to Queen Elizabeth II of Great Britain. Constantine is a broken man, and he dies in Italy, just months after being forced into exile for a second time. His despairing Sophie moves into a villa near Florence, a villa which for many years to come will function as the exiled family's only fixed point of reference.
Constantine's son, George, is now proclaimed the new king. Yet in the first instance, George is only able to call himself King George II for a period of a year. Then he too is sent into exile, and Greece is proclaimed a republic. In the 11 years that Greece is a republic, the country witnesses a total of 23 governments, 13 coups and one dictator. In 1935, the Greek people vote to re-establish the monarchy. And George II returns home to Athens. As George has no heir, his younger brother, Paul, is now crown prince. In 1936, Paul proposes to Kaiser Wilhelm's granddaughter, Frederica of Hanover. Like her husband-to-be, Frederica is also a descendant of the father-in-law of Europe. The couple marry in Athens, and the pair, who are second cousins, very quickly achieve a high degree of popularity. The following years see the arrival of their three children, Sophia, Constantine and Irene. My father became uh, king on the 1st of April, 1947, when his uh, elder brother, King George II, died. At the funeral, the mourners will have to follow the coffin for many miles, and the family has its doubts as to whether the six-year-old Constantine will be able to last the distance. My father took me for a very long walk, which lasted for two, three hours, uh, over the hills just to see if I could uh, actually walk with him in, 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 in the funeral. And uh, during the funeral, I still remember in my mind, I wanted to see if men could cry. So I was looking into the crowd to see if men could cry, and I was very, very impressed to see men weeping. King Paul is now the third brother to sit on the throne, and the Greeks are delighted with their new king. King Paul sends his uncle Goggy and Aunt Marie to represent him at the coronation of Queen Elizabeth in London. Princess Marie, who during the Nazi occupation of Austria had smuggled her teacher Freud out of the country, is now in attendance as the official Greek representative. She hated that kind of pomp. She was bored to death. So she seated in the stores with tiara decoration and everything. She couldn't care less. So she turned to her neighbor and said, would you like me to psychanalyze you during the coronation? So the gentleman, a bit amazed, said, why not? So she started asking questions, and he started talking and talking. They didn't see one thing of the coronation, of course. The gentleman next to her was François Mitterrand, future president of France. Greece's economy is in a poor state, so Queen Frederica organizes a luxury cruise to encourage tourism, and by inviting Europe's nobility, she hopes to ensure that Greece will receive a lot of media coverage. We were about 300 cousins, uh, uncles uh, on that boat. It was great fun. It was also hope that some marriages or engagements would come out of that beautiful arena. Tourism blossoms in the 50s, but the cruise does not lead to many marriages. Although the meeting between Frederica's eldest daughter, 16-year-old Sofia, and her contemporary, Don Juan Carlos of Spain, will however end in marriage many years later. Twenty-year-old sailing enthusiast, Crown Prince Constantine, is very keen to represent his country at the forthcoming Olympic Games. He is therefore encouraged to contact the Danish yachtsman, Paul Elston. 
I said, who, who, who's he? I, you know, the ignorance of, at that time was quite considerable. And I was told that he's the greatest sailor in the world, he's had three gold medals and all that. So I said, okay, I'll ask him. Elstrom says that he would like to help Constantine in the Olympic trials, which take place three months before the actual games. On the first race, I came to the first mark, 400 meters in front of the second boat. I'd never done that in my life before. Anyway, we came third in the, in the regatta and um, I was very proud. And he explained to me that I was a very bad sailor. He said, you have to sail for six to eight hours every single day. Elstrom pushes Constantine until he's ready to drop. And at the games themselves, which are held in Rome, the Crown Prince and his crew manage to climb to the top of the podium. Not since a Greek won the standing long jump discipline 50 years ago has the country managed to win a gold medal. And the celebrations go on for days. A few years later, Constantine becomes interested in the Danish king's youngest daughter, 15-year-old Anne-Marie. I actually saw a picture of her in a magazine. And, and I said, that's it. I said, well, I want to go to Denmark and meet her. And I remember my father said, well, how, how are you going to do that? I said, well, I'll, I'll write a letter to the king and um, say that I'm going to be in Denmark uh, for a sailing meeting with Mr. Paul Elfstrom, uh, which was feasible. And... Um, I don't know if I ever told Paul, Paul that uh, I used him as an excuse to go and see this girl. <laughs> the meeting takes place, and some months later, they see each other again at a family wedding. We spent, whatever it was, four or five days in, in Athens for the wedding, which was a wonderful occasion. And I think probably there it was that the sort of... Um, we fell in love. They meet again shortly after, and 22-year-old Constantine uses the occasion to propose to 15-year-old Anne-Marie. I said, for goodness sake, do not tell my parents because they will have a fit, uh, which he couldn't understand, but I persuaded him, and I think he realized that they probably would have had a fit. <laughs> so it wasn't until, in fact, six months after we had got engaged unofficially that we did tell my parents. The biggest shock was for my father-in-law. I asked him if I could marry his daughter. And the poor man got such a shock that he got up. He never said a word to me. He just got up, took me by the hand, and put me in a room with, and locked me in there with, with no lights. So I had to sort of grope around to find the a light, and then I found the light and opened it. And I found out it was, it was in his toilet. And I couldn't understand what I was doing there. And, and he had gone off to find his wife to tell him that this fellow wants to marry our daughter. What do we do with him? <laughs> this results in the engagement being made official and everything looks set for the future. But then King Paul suddenly dies, and the shocked 23-year-old Constantine must now be sworn in as Greece's new king. Later the same year, Anne-Marie finally reaches 18, and the couple can now marry. Like his bride and both his parents, Constantine is also a descendant of the father-in-law of Europe. The wedding in Greece was uh, spectacular. They, I, I was the first reigning king to get married in Greece. It was a huge wedding from every point of view, from the participation of the people, um, from the point of view of all the heads of state who came there from all over the world. Um, it was a beautiful day. Uh, the whole atmosphere was magic. In the years immediately following the wedding, the young, good-looking couple are the world's most talked about and most photographed royal pair. But problems quickly begin to mount up. When George Papandreou, the leader of the democratically elected government, wishes to replace the Minister of Defense in order to clean up the officer corps, Constantine refuses to allow him to do so. Papandreou resigns, and there follow a number of politically turbulent years before things go seriously wrong. The 21st of April of 1967, in, certainly in my mind, was the, uh, the worst day of my life. I mean, you, you know, the, you suddenly wake up with a telephone call from my private secretary who, who told me that they were machine gunning his house down. 
So I said, what the hell are you talking about? And um, he said, listen. And I could hear the bullets going flying through his, uh, his, his house. And he said they're wearing uniforms. So I didn't know if this was a communist uprising or what, what it was. And then uh, we, uh, my wife and I, we put on the radio, like every other Greek, to find out what the hell was going on. And there I found out that I had made the coup. I'm sitting there not knowing what the, what's going on, and uh, somebody was announcing that I had made, in the, in the name, not I, but in the name of the king, we are taking over, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, very shortly after that, my house was surrounded by tanks. And uh, my husband sent somebody down from the police force to find out what was going on, and this person didn't come back. He sent others, several, during that time. They didn't come back, so we realized that that was it. There was nothing we could do about it. The next morning, Constantine drives to the military headquarters. He is forced to accept that a group of colonels have carried out a coup d'etat. I didn't see him until late at night, and he looked a complete wreck and was desperate about the whole situation. But, um, but life had to go on. And then my son was born. Uh, Pablos was born a month later, so that at least was some joy. <laughs> I, I had to find a solution and restore democracy to my country. And I tried to do that within about eight months of the coup. And uh, I tried to lead the armed forces in overthrowing the colonels. It didn't succeed. And so I had to leave the country with my family and we went into exile in Rome. We took nothing with us because when we left the house, we left in the morning and we were expecting to be away from the house for a few days. We went to the north of Greece. And so we just had a few things with us, clothes, uh, whatever we would have for a trip, but nothing else, and everything else was left there because we were convinced we were going to be coming back again. The family spend the next six years in exile in Rome until the monarchy is officially abolished by referendum in 1974. Then Anne-Marie and Constantine move to England, where they move into a property outside London. And it's here that the last of the family's five children are born. In our families, unfortunately, there are many people in exile. But for King Constantine, I'm particularly sorry because he's by far the more Greek of all of us. I grew up there, studied there, served there, was head of state of the country. I love my country. I miss my country, I'm homesick. Constantine and Anne-Marie's eldest son is Crown Prince Pavlos, who in 1995 marries Marie Chantel with more than 200 royals in attendance. Constantine's sister, Princess Sophia, marries the Spanish Don Juan Carlos in 1960. My sister, well, uh, she married King Juan Carlos, was at that time was not even uh, proclaimed Prince of Spain. Juan Carlos's grandfather had been dethroned when Spain was declared a republic in 1930. Yet General Franco, who now rules the country as dictator, wishes to re-establish the monarchy. Therefore, in 1969, Franco decrees that on his death, Juan Carlos should succeed him as head of state. This happens in 1975 and Juan Carlos and Sofia are installed as king and queen of Spain. Juan Carlos was so intelligent and was, he knew how to navigate among all these rocks and these dangers. And thanks to him, the transition from a dictatorship to a democracy went on very smoothly. And when a group of rebel Spanish officers stormed the country's parliament in 1981, and attempt to enlist the support of Juan Carlos, the king flatly refuses. 
democracy has come to stay, and the attempted coup is stamped out in less than a day. Today, Juan Carlos and Sofia have three grown-up children, Elena, Cristina, and Crown Prince Philippe. Philippe, who is the great-great-great-grandson of the father-in-law of Europe, will one day succeed his father as King of Spain. Back in 1920, King Constantine I of Greece needs to find a suitable match for his daughter, Princess Helen, and the choice falls on the Romanian crown prince. By deserting from his regiment and marrying a commoner without his parents' permission, Crown Prince Carol has already shown himself to be the black sheep of the family. Yet his father has demanded that his son's marriage be annulled, and now Carol is available again. Helen and Carol are married in 1921. And nine months after the wedding, their son Michael is born. A son who will be king at an unusually young age. Carol of Romania was extremely intelligent. I think rather wicked, very difficult, had a very bad reputation among royalties, uh, was very, very unfaithful to his wife. Within a year of his marriage to Helen, Carol has already fallen for another woman. She is Magda Lupescu, the daughter of a Romanian craftsman. And when the relationship becomes public knowledge, Carol is forced to renounce his position as heir to the throne and go into exile. The heir of the throne renounces and all that, so the next one has to take over, so the next one happened to be me. Uh, 1924-25, uh, what was I, three, four years old. Michael's grandfather dies after just two years as heir and the now six-year-old Michael is proclaimed the new king of Romania. And just like his young contemporaries, the king loves going to the circus. The little boy is exceptionally close to his mother, Helen. My relationship with her was not simply a relation from mother to son. It was also a friendship. It goes further even than a normal relationship. I don't know what we would have done with all the things that followed after. Yet life as a single mother is not easy for Helen. I saw she was very unhappy from a certain stage. Very often I saw her crying. And... Uh, I didn't go into any details of that, but I knew there was something that was uh, very wrong. And things don't get any easier for Helen when the government, which misses having an adult head of state, suddenly recalls Carol and makes him king. In 1930, nine-year-old Michael is once more face to face with his father. If I would have been a snail, if you can say so, I would have gone back in my shell immediately. Because I didn't know the man. And then from that moment on, things started getting from bad to worse. As Carol is still obsessed with his mistress, and when she also arrives in Romania, Helen chooses to leave the country. Michael is now raised by a group of officers and is only allowed to see his mother twice a year. These meetings take place in Italy, where she lives until the situation changes drastically in 1940. Carol, who has established an absolute monarchy, is now very unpopular, and he looks to a general, Antonescu, for support. Yet Antonescu immediately exploits his new position to depose Carol. Instead, 19-year-old Michael is now proclaimed king for the second time. Carol spends the next few years traveling Central and South America. He has taken his mistress, Madame Lupescu, and the entire family fortune, jewels included, with him. The media follow them intensely. 
the Second World War has broken out, and when Hitler declares war on the Soviet Union, he is immediately joined in his declaration by the dictator Antonescu. King Michael knows nothing of this decision. My mother woke me up that day that the war was declared, saying that the BBC radio said that we attacked Russia with the Germans, and I knew nothing about it. I called up the Prime Minister then and said, what about this? I said, well, I, why didn't you tell me? I said, well, uh, he said that I thought you'd see it in the newspapers. I said, thank you. Michael is strongly against the alliance with Germany, but he is unable to do anything about it until 1944, when Antonescu is lured into an ambush. One day, Michael and uh, cousin Ellen decided to get rid of the dictatorship. So they arrested him, and uh, they didn't know where to lock him in the palace. And so they locked him in the strong room of the palace among the silver. The Antonescu regime collapses. 60,000 German soldiers are taken prisoner, and the Russian army moves in. Romania spends the rest of the war on the Allied side. After the war, Michael falls in love with his Danish-French relative, Princess Anne of Bourbon Palm. Michael wants to marry, but cannot get a clear answer from Anne. It was difficult because he was a king. And I'd been brought up sort of simply, I didn't think I could keep that role in a way. It's a, it's a horrible responsibility. So I always said, I'm thinking about it. The Russians have established a communist government in Romania, and in 1947, King Michael is forced to give up the throne and go into exile. He is only allowed to take a few personal effects with him. Anne has accepted Michael's proposal, and his uncle, King Paul of Greece, arranges the wedding. Both the bride and groom are descendants of the father-in-law of Europe. The couple choose to live in England first, where they have to work for their living. There we had a little uh, sort of uh, vegetable garden farm with the chicken. We worked on it and we sold the products. It's here that Anne gives birth to the first of the couple's five daughters, and the girls have a mixed upbringing. Sometimes we maybe were invited to Windsor Castle or Buckingham Palace, which was what you would call a princess's upbringing. And then we went back and we had to wash up and we had to clean the dishes and we had to, uh, you know, just do the normal things every day. So it was an interesting life. It was always two sides to it. The family's economy does not improve on the death of Michael's father, Carol. For even though he had taken a multi-million dollar fortune with him when he left Romania, he has left nothing to Michael. Madame Lupescu, however, continues to live a life of luxury. After the fall of the dictator Ceausescu, Michael and Anne are allowed to visit Romania for a few days for the first time in 1992. And it becomes a real triumphal procession. There were crowds and crowds of people, and the more we came close to town, the thicker the crowds became. There were people climbing up into the trees. There were 900 to a million people in the streets and because that was something which was, uh, you know, out of this world. <laughs> Even though Michael and Anne have their Romanian citizenship restored in 1996, they live today in Switzerland. Their oldest daughter, Margarita, and her husband, the Romanian-born Prince Radu, also live in Switzerland. Back in 1934, King Alexander I of Yugoslavia is the victim of an assassination. As his son, Peter, is only 11 years old, the throne is temporarily taken over by his uncle. But when in 1941 the uncle enters into a pact with Hitler, a group of officers carry out a coup and proclaim the now 17-year-old Peter as king instead. Yet after only a few weeks on the throne,
Peter is forced to flee when the Germans start their bombardment of Yugoslavia. The Greek princess Alexandra, whose father died after being bitten by a monkey, is now a 20-year-old debutante in London. Here she is presented to King Peter of Yugoslavia, who was two years her junior and now living in London. Alexandra and Peter fall madly in love and marry in 1944. The following year, Alexandra gives birth to the couple's only child. They produced a son who's the present uh, pretender to the throne, Alexander. And in order that he could succeed, he had to be born on Yugoslavian soil. So by special law, Churchill made hotel clarages in London for one day, Yugoslav territory. So I was actually born in London in Yugoslav territory. Very official, quite an extraordinary event. Alexandra and Peter are very popular figures in London society. They are young and beautiful, and as Peter has a considerable fortune in Yugoslavia, they are wealthy too. We really didn't have a home initially. We stayed at Claridge's, and then there were moves to, to Switzerland and France. Peter is restless and will not remain in one place too long, so the little family is constantly moving from hotel to hotel. Most of the Balkans is now under communist control, and the Yugoslavian monarchy has officially been abolished. The young couple lose everything they own. They are now both stateless and homeless, and a tragic future awaits them. Alexandra worships her husband, but Peter's growing frustration with his destiny increasingly puts pressure on the marriage. One moment they, they wanted to separate, and then another moment they came together. This finally becomes too much for their nine-year-old son, Alexander. He writes a letter to his father. I organized uh, a meeting uh, between them in Stad, and they got back together. That was uh, in 1954, Christmas 1954. I remember that vividly. And they were extremely happy. Yet this happiness does not last long. Peter leaves his family and moves to America. Uh, he died in, uh, in America. Uh, unfortunately, he was uh, abusing alcohol at the time. He was extremely uh, uh, depressed. Uh, it was a tragic case. Alexandra never gets over the break with Peter, and on a number of occasions, she attempts to take her own life. There was an unfortunate attempt in 63, and she took some sleeping tablets, and uh, she was very depressed. And uh, I was uh, visiting some friends, and I had to break into the house, and I found her on the floor. Luckily, Alexandra's life is saved, and she lives for a further 30 years. In 1989, Crown Prince Alexander begins working from his home in London to re-establish democracy in Yugoslavia. And in this connection, he gets to know Kostunica, the country's future president. The friendship develops, and with great popular support, Alexander visits his homeland for the first time in 1991. The family's properties are returned after the fall of Milosevic, and Crown Prince Alexander is finally allowed to return home with his family in 2001. I think it's thanks very much to this effort since 89, since the collapse of the Berlin Wall, uh, since the collapse of uh, Moscow, as one might put it, uh, that uh, the work with these fine people, that we're actually here. The negotiations in coming here uh, took place in a very calm way, and now I have the responsibility of these two palaces which were built by my grandfather. After having returned to Yugoslavia, the Crown Prince and his wife, Crown Princess Katerina, spend the majority of their time on charitable works. Old King George I's other living descendants include his grandson, Prince Michael of Greece, who is a historian and writer. 
He lives in Paris with his wife Marina, who is an artist. And Duke Amadeo of Aosta is amongst George I's great-grandchildren. He has a house outside Florence, where he lives with his wife, Duchess Silvia. In the next episode, we will follow the two youngest children of the father-in-law of Europe, Princess Tura and Prince Valdemar. Valdemar marries a very special French princess. And every time that she would listen at the bell of a fire, even if it was during an official function, she would leave the table, take off her tiara, put her cask of a fire, and rush to the place of the fire to try to help the lighten.